excited to be celebrating our new temporary exhibit, Guitar, the Instrument of the World. I'm incredibly thrilled to welcome my creator of my guitars here tonight to share some amazing pieces from his collection. Thanks, guys. Appreciate you coming. Thank you, Rebecca. So, um, glad you guys came. Some of you I recognize from other clinics we did up at Fat Board, so thanks for coming again. And I'm just going to dig right in because we don't have a whole lot of time before the band starts. So, start at the beginning. It's actually really not the beginning, but this is a Rickenbacker frying pan guitar from 1941. This is considered one of the first electric guitars because it, even though it's a lap steel, it has a round neck so that you could actually play it like a normal guitar, like a normal electric guitar. You could fret it, you could play chords, you could hold it like this. Um, this is the last period for those guitars. Come on up sit down if you want, guys. There's more chairs. We can get more, too. And... Um, this is a guitar in my collection. I, I wanted one for a long time, and I hunted and hunted and finally found this one. It's in really good shape. Um, this is called a horseshoe magnet, which was a very normal um, thing to do for le early electric guitars. And uh, Rickenbacker continued this on in their bases, and they had some of the first early bases. But I'm going to pass it around, let you guys check it out. This is bake light material. The first ones didn't have bake light. They were actually solid, and they were chrome. And this one is uh, painted silver. The only thing I would ask is when you when you touch it, don't rub on the logo because it's just a sticker, so it will come off. And we're here to have fun, so the drinks are back there, and feel free to shout me down and ask any questions you want. We just want to enjoy some guitars and look at all the cool stuff that's here. The mic has magnets that go over it, besides pulling down like a usual magnetic pickup. It actually goes through all, the pickup. All around. Yeah, yeah. There's there's some under it and well, some and above it. Stain should be around yeah. forever. Yeah, they're great. They're very people who play steel love those guitars, and still very highly desirable. What's that worth? What's it worth? Well, mm. uh, it's probably worth like you know. Four thousand dollars. I have the matching amp for it too. It had a. It was like a set. Um, maybe a little bit more. What year is it? 40? It is forty-one. It's probably actually forty. But that's pretty late for those. You know, usually the early ones, thirty-seven or eight or nine, somewhere there. Really early ones. And a friend of mine owns the first two, and if you get Vintage Guitar Magazine about six months ago, there was an article in there about his first two lap steels and um, you know it's considered you know one of the first electric guitars ever made um, that you could actually play like a normal electric guitar and since we're talking about my friend um, I'm going to move on to the Stratocaster and there's a story that relates to him this is a very strange guitar for many reasons it's one of the few ever made with a matching headstock. Fender made guitars in Sunburst, and then if you wanted a color, you would have to custom order it. You'd have to call up and pay extra money. And for some reason, a few guitars ended up with matching headstocks. They didn't do Stratocasters and matching headstocks. This one is Candy Apple Red with a matching headstock. And nobody really knows if they just like did a batch of these or if people ordered them. It is my belief that the factory just kind of did some test ones because they were starting the Jazz Masters with matching headstocks. And every one of these I've ever seen has a transition logo, which was, you know, late 64, which is what this one has. I have a blue one with a matching headstock as well. And I've seen a white one and a black one. But anyway, I was telling you about my friend who has a lap steel. He, he, plays, in a, he plays with the Eagles sometimes. He's like an you know, auxiliary musician who, who uh, sets him with different bands. But he was in town, and he came in to look for lap steels, and he was telling me about this Strat that he had found at one point. And um, 
long story short, I, he started describing this guitar. And in the course of six months, we figured out it was actually the same guitar. And uh, we found pictures of the guy that he had sold it to. And the guitar had went to Germany and then was traded in to me for a Les Paul. And, um, you know, I got pictures of him holding it and pictures when he first had it. And um, he told me that he was on tour and he went to a party and he was looking for a Strat. And he went in the guy's bathroom and this guitar was hanging in the bathroom. And uh, he talked the guy out of it and that's how he got it. It was in L.A. and I'm sure it was kind of a crazy party if you know what I'm saying. But, uh... That's how, that's how he got it, and it ended its way back to me and uh, into my collection. And um, I'll, I'll let you guys check it out. You know, this has clay dots, which they stopped doing in 64. Uh, they go to pearl dots. And when I said transition logo, it is no longer uh, what they call the spaghetti logo. It's uh, more of a block logo. Once again, please don't rub on the logo. This one's always half, already half gone. And you can see the undercoating. These were layered. They were, they had a white undercoating, then they had like a, a gold or silver, depending on the time period, and then a kind of a clear red, which is how they achieved the candy apple red. And if you look closely, you can see the layers of it. This is called a green guard, which they only did until 65. This is a, you know, pretty rare and valuable guitar because, you know, all strats are popular and important guitars in the world of electric guitars. So if anyone's got any questions, just shout at me. You're the first one every time. <laughs> You'll be happy. Yeah. Okay. Sorry to just plow through these, but we started a little late. This is a, it's actually called a duo jet, even though it's green and duo jets are considered black. Gretsch did some weird things. One of the things they did is they called this model a jet and they called them duo jets, but if it's red, it's called a fire jet. But they never had a name for the green ones, so they're still duo jets. This uh, guitar is in Cadillac green, which is my favorite Gretsch color. And it's, um, it's a guitar that is important to me because I chased these guitars, Cadillac Green Duo Jets, for a long time and never actually got one. And once I drove to Nashville to get one and halfway there, the guy called me and said that he had, had a double the offer. So, waste of my time. But anyway, in the course of years, I've, I've tried to get one. I finally got one. It's really nice. It came from the original owner. And there's like a little story from his father in here. One of the things I want to say is Gretsch really knew how to do things with style. And if you look closely, the case itself is just fabulous as well. They put the, you know, the name in there and they tooled the leather around the edges. It's got cowboy like engraving or you know, whatever they do, leather to make it nice around the outside. So they, were, they really knew how to make things nice and um, they, were, they were into style. These are hollow. These were their competition against Les Pauls. But the only difference is that they're hollow, so they don't really sound like Les Pauls. They're much more airy and jangly, sort of like a Rickenbacker would be. And Gretsch was one of those companies that did things very sporadically. They would, they would not be very consistent, and they were often sloppy. And the first few of these I've seen, I thought they were refinished um, when I first started, but they're, they're not. They just, they just painted them very poorly. Often the tuners are crooked and things like that. But, you know, it's part of their chime, you know. They were kind of cowboy country guitars, and they were about how they looked a lot, you know. The Beatles obviously played one. This one is a, it's a 57. Whenever you see these hump and lays, you know it's 57, which is also the year that George Harrison Stoogette was, so it's kind of a desirable, desirable thing. These pickups are called... Um, the Armands, they used these until 58 when they changed. Um, so, you know, it's a cool guitar. It has gold parts, which is worn, but uh, one of my favorite guitars. Yeah, it's really clean, actually. 
Here's the guy, the original owner. And it's a long story, but there's a story here from his son talking about the guitar and a brief history of the guitar. Which is always nice, if you're a collector, it's always nice to get the history of the guitars. Anybody wants to see that stuff, they're certainly welcome. And the theme was the greatest hit, the greatest hits of guitars. So I tried to grab what I thought was significant guitars through the history of, you know, uh, American instruments mainly, which is what I collect. And uh, the next guitar is a Martin D18. No significant reason why I picked a D18 other than I just like that guitar. This guitar um, is a 1950s D18. It's one of the simpler models. And with Martin guitars, the letter designates the size and the, um, and the numbers designate the woods. So D means dreadnought and 18 means mahogany. So this was a fairly simplistic guitar. You know, it has tortoise binding and you know, really nice spruce top and all the best woods and all the best bracing. But in the model of the D guitars, 18 is low because they did, um, you know, uh, 18, 20, 21, 40, 41, 2, all the way up to 45, which it doesn't really translate to better sounding. It's just better, you know, uh, better wood qualities, more expensive woods and abalone and things like that. And I have a D45 here, which I'll show you guys in a few minutes, but... I don't know if it's a tune. You can hear, even with these dead strings, it's, it's a good sound of guitar. Very loud. And since we're talking about Martins, we'll shift gears and then talk about the most expensive Martin guitar. This is a 1968 Martin D45, which I bought from the original owner last year. It was her husband's and he passed away. And you can see the abalone around it. It has abalone on the sides as well and all around the back. Yeah, has abalone around the neck and um, inlays in, in it as well. These guitars were made from 1931, I'm sorry, 39 to 42 or 44, somewhere in there. And they didn't make many of them. And those are extremely valuable. And then they started making them again in like 68, which is what this guitar is. Both batches are extremely limited. So the ones, the early ones, are worth probably half a million dollars now, four or five hundred grand, somewhere in there. They're made out of Brazilian rosewood, which is an endangered species now. They're often made with the prettiest rosewood that Martin had. You know, extremely figured wood. Once again, they, they took a lot of care of how these guitars looked because people were paying for that. Um, the structure is the same. It's still a dreadnought guitar, just like the 18. It's just not as fancy. The 18 isn't as fancy as the 45. So, like, when you're dealing with Martin guitars, let's say that's an 18 and this is a 45. So the 45 has the most inlay, the most engraving. It has some features on the back of the headstock that start appearing when you get up in the 20, 20 numbers which is like a volute, a fancy volute. But the basic structure is the same. The way the neck's joined, the body's joined, all that is the same. And so, you know, the tone often is sometimes better, in my opinion, with the cheaper guitars, because what you're doing is you're adding weight to the guitar. 
I mean, not always, but, you know, it's just something, it's, that's why, you know, a 30s D18 is, is still, you know, $40,000, because it's a great guitar, even though it's a very simple guitar. I'm not going to pass this one around, uh, just because it's so clean. I mean, it's like really, really clean, but, you know, you rarely see these. It's the only one that I've ever had. <laughs> It's Brazilian, yeah. There's probably, I, I don't want to get this wrong, but I think there's probably less than 100 of the 68, 69s. These go for 50 to 100 grand, depending, you know, how clean they are and stuff. It's really cool, though. I, I got it with a had like all the paperwork, all the manuals. And the strange thing about this guitar, and I didn't remember this till recently, is I tried to buy this guitar probably 10 years ago. She had walked it into um, Ashland Guitar Show, I think. Um, and at that time, the money she wanted was just crazy. But in the course of whatever it was, 10 or 15 years, it wasn't crazy anymore. <laughs> So she contacted me back. I must have gave her a card, and I recently got it. Would that sell for original? You know, I used to know that because I had the receipt. I think it was like two hundred and forty dollars or something like that, which was a lot of money back then. You know, um, I don't know what that would compare to, but I bet you that's like ten grand or something. Just to shift gears, this is a modern guitar, and um, since the exhibit is about guitars and you know the the beauty of guitars, I thought I would bring this. This is a guitar that I was involved in making with Thai guitars. It's the first prototype for the bass that they made, and this scale length, which was a scale length that I play. They had made one before that was a short scale, but I just I'm not into that. And Ty approached me about being their first dealer. I said, I'll do it, but you have to make me a bass. So he engraved this bass for me. Um, I came up with a concept and we worked on this for about a year. This is actually turquoise on the outside of it. And he made a really super fancy back plate, which I took off and um, put this one on because I didn't want to scratch it all up. But it has um, a Native American on the back plate and it's like super cool engraved, but I don't have it with me. The neck on this thing is really wide and it has the feel of like a, a Music Man Stingray. I, I wanted a Music Man Stingray sound, but I also wanted it to be kind of Gibson-like. So the wood is mahogany and the neck joint is, is like a Gibson. So that was the theory behind this bass. And most people think, oh wow, it's going to be really heavy, but it's actually not. It's, it's fairly light for what it is. You're certainly welcome to check this one out. Yeah, those are the same pickups that are in Music Man's. So where the pickup placement is may not make much sense to most people because they're right next to each other, but that's a very, that's a stingray kind of thing to do. Yeah. Well, here's the deal. They're not doing hand engraved ones anymore, I don't think. But when he was doing them, they were like 14,000 bucks. That's completely handmade, and it took like a year and a half to get it. Those were called the A models. Now they do them all on machine. I think they're four or five grand or something. So a little more Yeah. And I'm not even sure if they, they, the thing about those guys is they change their models frequently. It's hard for me to keep track of them. This is um, a 1942 Gibson Southern Jumbo, and um, Gibson models, their dreadnoughts look different. I don't know if you can notice, but this is called round shoulder. If you look at it next to the Martin, you can see the difference between a square-shouldered and a round-shouldered guitar. So the early Gibsons, their dreadnoughts are round shoulders. 
45. Martinelli did that on very few models. Uh, they, they did like a you know a D35 in the 70s or something, but mostly they're square shoulder. In this time period, Gibson would put banner logos. That's what this is called. It's called a banner logo. When you hear people talking about a banner, it's the time period between 1942 and 44. My brain's not working tonight, but I'm pretty sure that's right. Um, between 42 and 44, they often don't have serial numbers. This model was a model that I think is the coolest Gibson model. For some reason, I, I love the Sunburst. I love the, the uh, parallelogram inlays. And Gibson flat tops are my favorite guitars. So this is the most desirable time period for, for a Southern Jumbo. It's the early one. The neck is very large, which is typical for late 30s, 40s Gibson guitar. So, also you can notice the logo is a script logo. That's the early style script logo. Before this, in the early 30s, they said the Gibson. They started this around 36. And then after that, they add the banner. You guys are certainly welcome to check that one out. So anybody have any questions or anything? Nothing? Okay. This is a 54 Stratocaster, which is the first year for a Strat. Oh, yeah. The details on this are that it has what you call a football switch tip. It has the, the low, larger tone knobs, and it has a round string tree and Bakelite pickup covers. The real early 54s, the real early 54s had the serial numbers on the back plate. Only the very first 50, I've had a couple of those. But then they go to on the neck plate. Um, the, like I said, this is the first year for the Stratocaster. The serial number on this one is 492. And this guitar I got from a gentleman in Philly and he had came to the Philadelphia Guitar Show and walked it around and had no idea and was like attacked by everybody. So he left and I gave him my card and I said, you know, just whenever you're ready, let me know. And I started driving home and I got about eight, 10 hours away and he called me. So this was after all week at the guitar show. I turned around, went all the way back and got the guitar. And then I sold it to a gentleman and it went in his collection for a long time. And recently, I got it back in trade. I do want to show you, this guitar is a super, super clean example. You rarely see 54s like this. Do you see those marks? Can you guys see those? That is what you call a curly cord mark. I don't know if you see it back there, but... What happened is those, curl, those cords from the 60s that were curly, people would set their guitars on them and they would stick to the finish. And that's what happened there. Other than that, the guitar is amazingly clean. And the pickup covers are big. Like, I'm gonna set it out in the case and after we're done, you guys can come up and check it out. I would ask that you please not tap the pickup covers because they are extremely fragile. The big light parts fall apart and it's rare to see one with the original parts on them. one has like all the gut, all the stuff, original like cloth and set of strings from the 50s. This is something I've never had with one. It has the original thing that was hanging in the store with it. And I've only seen this like once or twice in my life. It's like it's just like a little tassel that was like in the store, you know, just to make it stand out, yeah. Anymore with this stuff, you just don't find it that often. And I get my stuff from people I sold guitars to or trades and stuff, you know. A case is called a poodle case. 
they only used those cases in the early 54s, and then they went to the normal tweet case that you see with reissues. This is the earlier case. This is called a th thermometer case, and it has in it a 1951 Telecaster, which is the first year of the Telecaster. Most people think it's 52, but they actually made a few 51s. They made what they called the Broadcaster, and then a no-caster, and then a telecaster. And the reason they changed the name was because Fred Gretsch already had a broadcaster drum kit, so he, he threatened to sue Fender. So what Leo did is he cut off the name of broadcaster, so the no-casters just say Fender. That's why they're called no-casters, and that's a small time period, and then they go to the tellies. You can kind of see the case kind of looks like a thermometer. That's why they call it that. Okay, this is what they call Blackguard Telecaster. They used the Blackguard up until 54. And the serial numbers on the plates on Telecasters. And people often think the serial numbers mean, you know, if you got number one, you got the first one. It's not true like that. These were just in a bucket and they just grab them. So this is a 1200 serial number, even though it's a 51. And I've had lots of 52s with lower numbers. But uh, early guitars like this have slot screws, which they stopped doing in 52. And a different kind of bake like guard, which is hard to explain, but they often do this striping Not much to say, this is a great guitar, it's very light. I just had a mint one which I sold to Zach Brown that was like brand new, which I was gonna bring, but it, it left. <clears throat> this guitar is, I think, a, like a better player guitar, even though the condition isn't as good. But you never see 51s, this is the first 51 I've ever had. So you guys can check it out. Feel the neck, it's rather large. Is that the one you posted with the V on the neck? Uh, a couple weeks ago, you said, what's this neck go to? No, that was a 57. <clears throat> Usually you only see this case with no casters and broadcasters. It's the first tally I've ever had with this case. Are we running out of time? Five? Okay. We'll do. Um, I'm going to come back a little bit after they play. They're going to play for a while, and I'll come back. But I'll just hit the highlights real fast. This is a Gibson 345 in the custom colored Poham Blue. I got this guitar from Howard Least of Heart. It was in his collection. He traded me for a Martin. I collect Poham Blue guitars, and this is one of the rare models. You see Poham Blue in a lot of, lot of guitars. Not really a lot, but... More often in SGs and things like that, you'd never see a 345. It's rare because it's pale and blue with gold parts and it's just kind of a special prop, maybe the only one. <clears throat> we can talk about it a little bit more, but I just want to show you guys a couple things real fast. This is a 59 Les Paul. It used to belong to Brad Whitford and it is very figured, which is what makes them the most valuable. This guitar is nicknamed Snake, and Gibson did a remake of this guitar for me, and I have that guitar as well. This is the reproduction of that guitar that Gibson made. It's the first one, it's the prototype. We spent a lot of time at Gibson making these guitars, and you know, they, they I went down there quite a few times. Um, the very first ones I had to sign off on, and you can see they aged them, and they tried to you know reproduce the checking, and they did a really good job on this guitar. You're certainly welcome to come up and check them out. And we'll talk about the other ones. Thank you so much for coming, and I hope you stick around.
Make sure to walk around and look at everything. If you have any questions you want to ask me or anybody, that'd be great. These guys sound cool, so definitely have a drink and sit down and enjoy the band. <laughs>